Morena e hoa ma, nihi nui ka tatau. Thank you, uh, President Dave, for that introduction. Um, let me acknowledge um, uh, all of the mayors in the room. Um, my uh, two parliamentary colleagues, Jamie Strange, uh, Labour and Vicky Hamilton, and Paul Eagle. You've been here a long time. Uh, and all of you uh, here today, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, spend a bit of time with you. Um, Dave, your comments about collaboration and the relationship between uh, the government and the local government sector are uh, um, very pertinent. In, uh, in the areas that I'm responsible for, transport, housing and urban development, uh, local government are uh, among the most important of uh, the partners um, that, that we see as being vital to uh, implement our reform agenda. Obviously in transport, where it's um, the, the central local government partnership is structured in, into um, the entire way that the transport system works. But also in, in housing and built environment, uh, councils play such a critical role in land use regulation and um, uh, regulation of the building and construction uh, that and, and infrastructure delivery, um, all of the kind of the major enablers of, uh, of a good built environment and an adequate supply of, of quality affordable housing, uh, local government plays an absolutely essential role. So um, that's been part of our thinking and our calculations uh, right from the beginning. And I'm very, very encouraged uh, by the number of partnerships that even just in the last few months have emerged where we're working directly uh, with uh, councils, charting quite a new uh, way of, of doing things. So I'll give you some examples. Um, we, I mean, you've all seen lot, lots of publicity about uh, uh, the, the, our work with Auckland, for example, around uh, landing a fully funded 10-year uh, uh, transport plan, um, $28 billion plan for Auckland, a truly multimodal transport plan that um, changes the direction of transport policy in that city and directly links those transport investments to growth and development uh, in, a, in a desire to, to hitch transport investment to the needs and the, and the shape of the city that we want. So that's an example. We're also working very closely with uh, councils in the, um, in the Waikato uh, uh, on a Auckland to Hamilton um, regional growth corridor project that brings together transport investment, freight, passenger transport, roads, uh, housing development and, and urban growth in a very joined up way. And uh, that's a really exciting project. It not only brings central government uh, and local councils to the table, but also uh, EWI. So, um, and there are a number of other councils um, Ray Wallace and his team were in my office a couple of nights ago presenting an exciting uh, proposal for a way that central government uh, and that council can work together um, in an integrated way to do um, pretty ambitious uh, urban renewal and urban development together. And I, I welcome um, this kind of a partnership approach. We, we see the housing crisis as one of the great moral challenges of our time. And I say that because when home ownership rates are the lowest they've been in more than 60 years, when we've seen the kind of homelessness on the streets uh, of our communities that we've seen for the last couple of winters, um, we know something is terribly wrong. And it's not only the, the social hardship of people living in overcrowded and substandard conditions, um, it's the, uh, the, the fact that the housing crisis and what's been going on in the housing market is the major driver of increases in poverty and inequality. And the, the fact that housing, affordable home ownership, which has for so long been the kind of conveyor belt of social mobility in our country, the way that people have not only had the stability um, within which they can build their lives and raise families and borrow against the house to start a business. Um, but that opportunity to build an asset over a lifetime, um, that has been one of the big contributors to uh, 
this, the, the, the relative equality and uh, social mobility that we've always dreamed in New Zealand. That door has been slammed in the face of a new generation. And that, that is uh, something we should all be concerned about. And so um, uh, we see that that's why we see this as one of the big moral and ethical challenges of our time. And, um, but the answers are political and practical, and uh, it's our approach to take an, an absolutely pragmatic and curious approach to finding the best solutions to this problem that we can, regardless of where they come from and regardless of where they might sit in the conventional political spectrum. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, um, the breadth of our reform agenda. Um, uh, some of the particular initiatives that we have underway at the moment that I think are particularly relevant to local government. Um, and then I'll be very happy to take your questions today. Um, so I, I think of our reform agenda as having kind of two main uh, strands to it. One is that we have an urgent need to deal with the immediate unmet sort of social needs. And you would have seen we've put um, in the budget, we announced $100 million uh, in, on an, an additional funding to ramp up uh, uh, efforts to house the homeless this winter. So extending Housing First, the acclaimed uh, approach for dealing with chronic homelessness and rolling out and increasing the supply of, of emergency and transitional housing. Uh, and Dave, you're absolutely right. These, these, the acute problems of homelessness and severe overcrowding and substandard housing are not just in Auckland, they're not just in our biggest cities. And some of the smaller housing markets and regional centres around the country have also been acutely affected. Um, we committed to modernising and expanding public housing in Auckland. So we stopped the former government's sell-off of state housing. We are now investing $4 billion in building six and, and adding to the public housing stock, both state housing and community provided housing, a net additional 6,400 um, uh, homes, investing $4 billion to do that over the next four years. We're about to undertake a big review of the Residential Tenancies Act to modernise it and encourage more security of tenure because a third of all of us rent these days, and yet our rental laws are so old fashioned and give renters so little security of tenure, the average tenancy is, the median tenancy I should say, is about 11 months. So there's an incredibly high level of transience and that has very, very corrosive social impacts that I'm sure I don't need to explain. Kiwi Bill is our flagship affordable home ownership <coughs> policy. And we, it's about using the balance sheet of government, working with the private sector, to stimulate the building of affordable homes, modest starter homes for young families, that many of us in this room will have, will have typical of the homes that we first bought and began to raise our, our families in. We're addressing a market failure because only 5% of new builds currently are in that lower quartile that would be considered anything like affordable. The market, just for various reasons, hasn't been producing affordable homes. And that's what we're committed to doing with Kiwi Bill. So there's a whole range of programs there that are about addressing the immediate need and the, and the market failure. But if we're serious about long-term change and sustaining uh, the kind of progress that we want to see, we have to change the way that the market works now, uh, I did as much as anybody during the years in opposition to try to hold the former government to account for what we saw as their failure to respond to the housing crisis. But I never blamed them for causing it. The housing crisis that we um, are wrestling with now is the result of, of, of decades of policy failure, of decisions that were made 20, 30, 40 years ago. And um, for what it's worth, I'll give you what, what I consider to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse in this area. One of them is a tax system that encourages uh, untaxed capital gain and a culture of property speculation and land banking. And so we have to change the tax 
settings to discourage this massive funneling of our national wealth into residential property and speculation. The second is our planning system. It's not the fault of the RMA in our view. We're not of the school of thought that says we should rip up the RMA and throw it away. The RMA is an incredibly valuable framework that applies the rule of law and, pub and principles of public participation to land use regulation. But we do blame a highly restrictive form of urban planning that stops our cities, our, and, and you see this most acutely in the, big, in the high growth centres, that stops our cities growing up and out and creates an artificial scarcity of land that drives up urban land prices. And that triggers then a whole lot of land banking and property speculation. We need a planning system that preserves the kind of urban form that we want. Not talking about doing less planning, we're talking about doing more planning actually. That, but planning that allows our cities to make room for growth rather than trying to stop it and encourages quality intensification. One of the big challenges that we have as a country is that we've got to learn how to do second generation urban growth much better. We can't just continue with the, the mid 20th century model of urban development which is just to let the suburbs ripple out across the countryside and build a few motorways and roads. That doesn't work when you get to cities of scale. So reforming the way that we do um, uh, that the planning system deals with urban growth. Uh, and the next one is infrastructure financing. Our system for financing infrastructure is utterly broken at the moment. And uh, uh, councils in the high growth centres simply cannot continue to borrow to fund infrastructure, and actually nor should they. Central government doesn't want to be writing checks out at every months to fund the infrastructure for urban growth. And the current system puts an enormous pressure on developers to be the primary financing vehicle for the infrastructure that's needed to bring new land into supply. And that slows down developments. So we're working on a new system for financing infrastructure. Uh, and I hope we'll have more to say on this in the coming months. But the basic idea is to access long-term debt finance, for example, through infrastructure bonds at rates that the government can access and making that available to private developers who are willing to take the commercial risk on development. It has to rest on a, on a balance sheet somewhere and it cannot be councils and, and it should not be central governments. So it's a new approach to financing infrastructure that will lift the burden off councils of having to be uh, financing vehicles for infrastructure that's needed. And if we get this right, it will turn on the tap of infrastructure finance for new development and will allow our cities to respond to demand and grow when they need to. And those, the combination of infrastructure financing and a, and a planning system that allows our cities to make room for growth, <coughs> those are the critical things that we think will unlock uh, the urban land economy that will bring down urban land prices and allow an economy that's more about building things of value than speculating. So those are the, those are the four, did I, what did I say? The tax system, the planning system, uh, infrastructure, financing, and the fourth one really is um, uh, lifting the productivity and innovation in our construction industry. We have very, very high build costs in New Zealand and uh, in a relatively inefficient and low productivity construction industry. And you will have heard me talking in recent days about how off-site manufacturing and a modern industrialised approach to building houses using digital, high precision uh, automation, building homes and factories, and then putting them up on site in days rather than months. If we compare New Zealand build costs to the international benchmark for off-site manufacturing and building, um, we're more than, we're about two or three times the cost of the international benchmark for uh, factory-built housing at scale. So those are the, those are we think are the four big underlying challenges that we have, and uh, so as well as doing the things like Kiwi Build, as well as um, uh, modernising public housing, uh, uh, all of those things, we have to tackle these big structural problems. Uh, that are the cause of the mess uh, that we're in. 
There are some initiatives that I want to mention that, that are underway. One of them is uh, we're in the process of doing crunching through the policy work that will lead to, I hope, legislation in Parliament by the end of this year um, on Urban Development Authority. And the idea for this is we picked up some of the work that was done by the previous government on this. The idea is to create an institution that can partner with councils at the local level to lead and facilitate large-scale urban development projects <laughs> that the private sector cannot do on its own. Whether it's actually, it's easier at a greenfield site, much more challenging in, in brown and grey fields development. The, the uh, challenges of multiple uh, uh, fragmentation of title, of uh, infrastructure uh, needs, um, uh, the master planning that's involved, um, delivering a high quality public realm, these are very difficult things for the private sector to do on their own. An urban development authority is about tooling up a bit of government to get really good at working with the community and the private sector and local government together to do large scale master planned developments. The kind of developments where you might be, for example, building 5,000 or 10,000 new homes. And um, it's, it's designed to help us rise to the challenge of doing second generation urban, urban growth in a much better way and to be able to build that pace of the scale. So um, uh, the idea is that, is that the UDA will be a central government agency uh, set up as a, as a crown agency. Uh, it will be structured so at the local level for specific projects it will partner with councils, the obvious partners, uh, but also with EWE and other investors. And it will have the, the planning and consenting and financing tools um, to do the job as best. So, um, you will have also noticed that we uh, announced recently we're establishing a Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. This is about bringing together the disparate bits of housing capability which have been scattered across multiple APAR departments and ministries, bringing them together in one place and building capability in an end-to-end -end approach to the, entire, to the entire housing system, all the way from tackling homelessness through to home ownership and uh, urban development, infrastructure financing and, and planning. So that will, um, that's an important part of really building the institutional capability to do this work. Finally, let me say that um, just come back to the point that I made, I started off making, and that's that um, we recognise that local government is a critical part for us in this work. And we want to work with you around uh, these large scale projects, about um, raising the quality of sort of master planning and, and, uh, and urban development. We want you to do more uh, in the provision of public housing. And, uh, and I've had the conversation with many of you times um, about why shouldn't councils get the income related rent subsidy that community housing providers get and, and, uh, uh, and Housing New Zealand. And my answer to that is that there's no logical reason why you shouldn't, but there is a real fiscal constraint. We have enormous pressure on us at the moment to increase the supply of housing. And so everything that we do is measured against that benchmark, whether this is going to uh, boost, give us the kind of boost to uh, the housing supply that we need. I know that uh, local government uh, needs access to capital to do this, and we want you to do more. And, um, and very mindful of the fact that today's generation of council um, uh, and pensioner housing around the country was almost entirely built with concessionary loan finance from central government through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I've got officials working now on how we can mobilise capital to support local government ambitions to do more in this area, but also iwi and community housing providers. So um, that's something that uh, we're working on, and um, I'm going to do my best to be able to come back to you with uh, some proposals and plans on that um, in the coming months. Dave, why don't I leave that there? Would, if we've got time, I'd love to take questions from you. Well, thank you, Minister. And if there are, we have do have a few minutes. So, um, questions. 
Detective uh, Minister for the Livingstone Christchurch. Uh, thank you for your words. Totally hear what you just said over the IRS and constraints. Um, what about the option of the award of it though? Sorry, everyone. The award of that uh, IRS directly to council as opposed to, say, um, an NCD, which uh, the previous administration wanted us to have. It will just simplify things. So, not asking for an increase in the quantum necessarily, we all ask that, but perhaps just a more direct type of approach to the council. Yeah, so there are about 5,000 units of council provided housing around the country. Um, if we didn't award it directly, um, then that would be a very, very significant addition to the annual operating expenditure for the income tax rent subsidy. Um, you could argue that it may lead to some increase in supply, but um, at the moment, I can't. Um, we need to be counting all of that available budget that we can get into, into new builds. So um, I, I would like to get there. I just we can't do it straight away. And I know that. The effect of the policy settings in recent years has been to drive councils into these quite complex workarounds in order to try to get it. I, I, I understand that. Thank you. Uh, morning, Minister. Paul Crane from Manamaka Hi. I implore you not to forget about the regions. I stand here today. Uh, my daughter and her husband and four children had to move into my already four of us. We've got 10 living in my house. Otherwise, they'd be in a motel, and this is in the regions, and it's um, and it's costing us apart from a personal cost, um, uh, but it's also our employers are crying because they can't get accommodation for workers. A house advertised recently, four bedrooms, four hundred and fifty dollars a week, one hundred and fifty applicants. That's the reality of what we're doing. And and we've got homelessness in Morrinsville. People look at people living in garages and cars, and uh, so it's just not just the city. So I implore you to uh, remember those of us who are in the engine room of the economy. Sure. Thanks, Paul. I I, I completely accept your point. Um, the the rollout of now two thousand nearly nearly two thousand three hundred units of supported transitional housing around the country has been extended way beyond the main centres uh, into many, many regional communities around the country. And um, uh, we also, in, in the last couple of months, announced uh, 155 new uh, state houses in the regions. That's the first significant investment in building state houses in the regions in a couple of decades. So um, we are uh, very mindful that the housing pressures uh, on people uh, have gone way beyond Auckland and way beyond the main Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Um, well, some social cell down in the south. Um, we, uh, we, we have an area of huge growth where we are with the second fastest growing area in the country. A lot of that is Greenfields development at the moment. We'd very much like to intensify the development we've got. The problem is the Building Act is somewhat restrictive in the cost so for us to get concentrated medium density housing. I have heard some rumours that this new government is looking at changes to building it. Perhaps you can tell us what might be happening. So I think this afternoon um, the Honourable Jenny Celeste is going to be speaking to you and as Minister of Building and Construction she's she's the person really to, to give you a view about, uh, about the building. Act. But we do, I mean we want to see more density done well. Um, we need to move very quickly beyond the old monoculture of sort of standalone three bedroom homes. There'll always be an important part of the mix, but we need to be uh, provide a much better uh, range of choices for people in terms of affordability and the types of housing. And so using our land more efficiently through medium density with good urban design, uh, that is a really important part of the future. And so um, I think both the Building Act and Building Code, but also the planning system, need to accommodate this. Yeah, mine was around the Building Act as well, so uh, Toby Adams, Harrogate District Council. Even though the Building Act is um, legislated, it's not standardised across all of New Zealand, and we hear it constantly from developers that they don't want to work in certain areas because it's different, even though it's the same rule block, it's just interpreted differently. If we could get some sort of standardisation across it, there's 
not many things that change apart from soil type and the amount of wind that's flowing around. Um, everything else should be exactly the same across the country. Yeah. No, so I urge you to say that to Minister Solis. Minister um, Steve Hill from Cook the District Council. I thought I'd get in before we get Minister at the back. Um, look, uh, we're one of the districts again that's one of the small areas outside, and I think me and Brian actually met you a few months ago. Uh, Minister, thanks for that. Um, we wanted to we want to boost the housing supply, so um, more so um, appreciative that we're talking to MSD about um, um, your um, social housing and things like that. We're seeing things um, potentially being available, so that's great. But getting back to boosting housing supply, we're in one of those districts that um, um, we don't have private development markets. So um, Kiwi Build, for example, wasn't going to produce a lot through that process. Can you give us, and we've mentioned this before, can you give councils that want to build and be the developer an entranceway into that 10,000 houses funding? Thanks for that. So um, first thing I want to say is that there's a, there's a whole range of options uh, and tools for us to engage with you, right from um, in the emergency housing space, emergency and transitional housing, um, the work that uh, MSD uh, lead with through with the income related rent subsidy to support the, the provision of new public housing provided by community housing providers and others, and of course housing New Zealand, and then this Kiwi Bill. Um, so, uh, and, and some mix of those tools will hopefully help us to find a solution in, in, um, in your community, because I know there are some acute growth pressures. Um, I really appreciate the, the, the fact that your council has been willing to kind of step outside the, the traditional way of doing things and um, acknowledge that the market's not delivering what you need, and therefore it's an appropriate role for council to work out how you can meet the needs of the community. And, and by moving into that development space, I think that's an entirely sensible and logical thing to do. Yeah. Development's not without risk. That's the name of the game. Um, but our policy with Kiwi Build and all of the other things that we're doing, it's about appropriately sharing risk with the private sector to try and get the results for our people that the market otherwise won't deliver on its own. And so. Um, I really, uh, I urge all of you actually to think about how you can as councils not only use your regulatory role, but think about the potential for you to master plan and lead new developments that will provide the mix of housing and affordability that people in your communities need. Uh, and to set the standards for, for urban design and the public realm uh, and then work with the private sector as much as you can to deliver, to build those new communities and deliver those garrisons. And um, um, with Kiwi Build, we have to be um, really focused on the, on the parts, the communities and the parts of the market that are the most acutely affected. But um, I, I would urge you to talk to the, the Kiwi Build team in EMB about whether or not there's something that we can do together. Um, Maxine Bowden, Napier City Council. Hi, Maxine. Hi. Um, the income related rent subsidy minister, as you know now, is el people who are on the social housing register are eligible for that. Well, we have 376 pensioner flats in Napier, and those people will not necessarily be on the social housing register. And my concern is that if you extend the, the income related rent subsidy to councils, would that mean that the people who are currently and we do have criteria, low income and pensioners who are in our flats, would they still be eligible? Because the change, there would have to be a change in eligibility criteria for the income related um, rent subsidy. Yeah. So Maxine, I, for the reasons I outlined before, the, the immense pressure we have on us to, to use all of the available resources to build additional supply means that any consideration about extending the IRRS to councils is not going to happen in the short to medium term. That is, the question you raise is a genuine policy issue if, if, we, if and when we get to that point that we have to consider. But look, we want councils to do more, we want iwi and churches and the non-profit community and community housing providers to do more. I don't want us to be constrained by the income related rent subsidy. It's, it's not a scalable tool because it's, it's annual, it's cumulative operating expenditure that has to be dealt with in every budget round. That's not, it's not 
realistic to think we can scale that up as a way of helping councils and chips and everybody else to build more and do more. That's why I want to find new sources of capital and investment for, for you so that you can expand public housing. Not only the quantum of supply, but different kinds of public housing. You know, I think that um, assisted home ownership programs, we should be looking at, at growing uh, non-profit, tenure secure, affordable rentals in our communities. When you think how many people rent uh, now in New Zealand, the options are very limited. We should be looking at uh, building more houses that are purpose designed for, se for seniors. You know, lifetime design, walkable neighbourhoods, safe and secure, warm, dry, tenure secure. Wouldn't that be fantastic if we had that a kind of a 21st century version of pensioner housing uh, at, in, in, at scale for older New Zealanders? Because currently there just aren't the options there. Now, look, I'm very conscious of time. There's, I think we can take one more question over here, but I think you know, we're running out of time. You want to run out of time? Okay, okay. Right. All right. Thank you, Gabe. Kia ora, Mr. Paul Conan, Christchurch City Council. You talked before about uh, um, land banking and speculation, that kind of thing. Just wondering what your thinking was on how to overcome that and possibly by extension, stronger affordable housing requirements and developments. So, the way that we deal with the land bankers, I mean, we can tax them. There are things you can do to tax uh, land banking. But actually, the best and most sustainable solution is just to take away their profits. And there's a couple of ways that we do that. We get the capital gain out of the market for a start. The, this entrenched kind of Ponzi scheme uh, culture in our residential property industry is there because of there's an embedded expectation of very high levels of capital gain. You can't blame people for thinking that way because the entire tax system has been signposted in you for the last two or three decades telling them if you want to make a dollar, invest in residential property. And there's all these tax breaks to help you do it. So you can't blame people for, for responding to those policy signals that they've had from, from successive governments. So, um, but our goal is to, is to stabilise the housing market. And, and, and uh, we want the rental market to move to a market that's not based on this entrenched expectation of high levels of capital gain, but actually stable long-term yields. And, uh, and so, under our policies, increasing the supply of housing and reining in the unchecked demand forces, including foreign buyers, but also the, all of the tax breaks that encourage property speculation. That will get the supply and demand into, into balance over time. And you won't see the ridiculous levels of capital gain that we've seen in the last couple of decades, doubling and then a doubling again in our major urban markets. So that will, uh, when there is no realistic expectation of, an, of sustained capital gain, that's going to um, uh, change the psychology of the market. But in terms of land banking, we're, we're, with the entire business model is based on the idea that you buy up land on the fringe of the city and wait for urban expansion to inevitably mean that the boundary gets pushed out and you get zoned urban. And then you make this a massive windfall gain, which simply gets passed on on the price tag um, of, it, of the new homes in, that, in those developments. And the marginal unit affects the market price across the whole market. So those high land values then flow through, they get capitalised into land values across the market. That is why a planning system that's based on urban containment is so damaging. Because what it does is that it drip feeds a little bit of extra land, one street at a time, one neighbourhood at a time, one subdivision at a time, into a highly speculative land market. And that's why we believe there needs to be a new approach to urban growth that, uh, that uh, protects areas of special value, ecological value, or particularly growing soils, or, or coastal strip, or whatever, but sets them aside, sets aside land, open spaces for future generations, for parks and so on, that acquires land for, for transport and other network infrastructure, and then allows the city to grow and develop. 
as long as those developments can carry the full costs of their infrastructure. Don't come to the ratepayer or the taxpayer wanting a handout to subsidise infrastructure. Because if you do that, you simply are subsidising and encouraging development in places where it may not be economical. <coughs> but if we can move to this new approach that will protect the urban form that we want, to protect the natural environment while allowing our cities to grow, and I'll also talk about growing, allowing the city to grow up. <coughs> we have, in our cities, we've got to have more density and height. Density done well with good urban design standards, but we have to allow uh, the city to grow up. And if we do that up and out, we will massively increase the, the quantum of development opportunities in the market. And the land bankers will have nowhere to go. Because their entire business model is based around capturing land at rural prices and then slowly feeding it into a speculative land market. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time.